Ya Alimadeth. I hope you are all still keeping well and safe. My name is Noreen Sharif, and I will be your host for this evening. Now, before I share the program for tonight, here are some highlights of the board activities this week. Tomorrow, Sunday, 18th July, we begin with the Golden Club at 12.30 p.m., allowing the Jama'at to socialize and participate in lifelong learning. At 4 p.m. tomorrow, Sunday, 18th July, join Ithrib as we explore our heritage, reflections, and perception. How do leadership and ethics shape the heritage of our community? In this session, Dr. Farrakh Toppen will explore the concept of heritage and its relevance to our lives and contemporary times. To register, see this week's Al Sahar. On Tuesday, 20th July, join Purvis for more chair and standing exercises at 11 a.m. And finally, have you heard about the Global STEM Festival? The Aga Khan Education Board and Ithreb invite five to 18 year olds to participate in the Global STEM Festival, where they can explore and develop science, technology, engineering, and mathematics, STEM solutions at home, and share their favorite one with the global Jamaat. The theme of this year's Global STEM Festival is creating real life solutions for real life problems. The participants will be equipped with STEM skills to understand problems, find sustainable solutions, and consider their applications in real life. To register and for more information, please visit the.ismiley slash STEM Festival or contact STEM Festival at the.ismiley. And now on to tonight's program. Last Sunday, 11th July, Ismailis around the world celebrated Imamat Day, the 64th anniversary of Maulana Hazri Imam's ascension to the Ismaili Imamat. Imamat Day is an occasion to reaffirm our allegiance and gratitude to Maulana Hazri Imam for his benevolence and guidance, and to renew our commitment to the ethics of the faith. It is also an occasion of happiness, joy, and festivity. For those of you who missed it last week, on the local Jamaati Zoom calls, we shared a message from the president of the UK National Council, Itmadi Nushar Jivraj, and an inspiring talk by Alwaiz Dr. Shiraz Kabani on learning from our history about the Imam and Imama. We are showing it again tonight. We hope you enjoy tonight's program. Continue to stay safe and well. Ya Limadad. Bismillahir Rahmanir Rahim. My dear sisters and brothers, Ya Limadad and Imamat Day Mubarak to you all. Today is an auspicious day for our Jamaat as we commemorate the 64th Imamat Day of our beloved Maulana Hazri Imam. Imamat Day is a time that the global Jamaat use to reflect on the unique spiritual bond that we have with the Imam of the time. This bond is a source of strength which carries us through the journey of life. Imamat Day conventionally consists of collective in-person prayer and celebration. But like so many milestones over the past year, the majority of us are forced to mark this special day virtually. But I'm happy to be sharing in this moment with so many more of you than I would otherwise be. Maulana Hazrimam regularly reminds us that happiness is a blessing, and that ours is a faith of happiness. So on behalf of the National Council, all the institutions, and Mukikamriya Saibans, I wish you and your families the blessing of happiness, and pray that you share joy, laughter, and smiles with each other today and every day. This year, more than ever, we have been reliant on our Imam and our Jamaat as our support systems as we have navigated the uncertainty that the pandemic has thrown at us. 
the range and complexity of emotions and experiences have been unimaginable. I know there are people amongst us who have suffered immense loss, anxiety, and instability, but also incredible support, love, and togetherness as we have unified as one Jamaat in the face of this global challenge. It has been humbling to watch the teamwork, sacrifice, and love that have driven the fantastic work of our volunteers, both within our Jamaat as well as in the communities in which we live. On this Imamat Day, I would like to take the opportunity to share with members of the Jamaat the key areas of work the National Council is focusing on. In his guidance to leadership, Bolana Hazriman provided a number of key priorities that are critical for the long-term happiness and success of our Jamaat. And our focus for the Council is wholly underpinned by this guidance. Upon taking office, the National Council set out to establish a vision statement that would serve as a guiding force for all the work that we do. And it reads as follows. A Jamaat with faith and ethics, united and stable, that can uplift humankind today and for generations to come. As institutions, we have put in place structures and programs that serve to respond directly to those priorities. However, in all our efforts, we need the full and wholehearted engagement and support of the entire Jamaat to be able to deliver on Maulana Hazrimam's wishes. We should also remember that these are long-term generational objectives that we hope will sow the seed for the future success of our Jamaat in our ever-evolving society. As we all know, our Imam is dedicated to ensuring that all his murids enjoy a good quality of life, such that they are best placed to be able to succeed and give back to society. The saddening reality, however, is that we have sisters and brothers in our Jamaat who live in poverty. This is something that I know none of us will be content with, and one that the Imam is immensely concerned with. Our response to Maulana Hazrimam's objective of poverty elimination has been the launch of the Brighter Horizons program. We have been humbled by the early engagement of the Jamaat with this initiative, which speaks to the deep desire in our Jamaat to live according to the ethics of brotherhood and ensure the success of the Jamaat as a whole by contributing time, knowledge, and resource, as well as creating an environment where we are all safe to speak up and ask for help. The second key area of work revolves around the notion of pluralism, a term that is familiar to all of us, one that Maulana Hazrimam has referred to on countless occasions and one that speaks to the very essence of our faith, that we come from a single soul. It is therefore our responsibility to contribute to the communities in which we live and embody the Imam's philosophy of serving civil society. The wider world and the societies in which we live have started to speak loudly on topics like diversity and inclusion, almost as though the pandemic 
has given us a revitalized sense of perspective that we had lost sight of before. This past year, like no other, has reminded us of the fragility of the human race and the need for all of us, no matter our age, to take care of our health. Critically, however, this is not limited to our physical health, because equally important is the need to be aware and respectful of mental health, our third focus area. Across the globe, we have seen people, irrespective of background, suffering from issues such as anxiety, depression, loneliness, and more. Our Imam is very aware and focused on addressing issues of mental health within the Jamaat. We should, as a Jamaat, never be afraid to seek support, be respectful and aware of such issues, and offer a hand of brotherhood to anyone who is suffering. Lastly, we come to early childhood development. Many of the issues that we face today in relation to our quality of life can be addressed in a systemic way through effective early childhood education and development as a preemptive measure that ensures healthy foundations in the early stages of life. So it is with these four objectives front of mind that we are conducting our work in the institutions. And I know that many of you have been involved in delivering on these priorities. To you, I extend my most sincere gratitude. As I said earlier, however, the work that we are doing today requires the entire Jamaat to embrace these priorities and help us on delivering on Maulana Hazimam's wishes. Before I close, I would like to say a few words on the COVID pandemic. As you know, the UK government has indicated that the 19th of July could mark the end of restrictions around social distancing, the mandatory wearing of face coverings, and more. From a policy standpoint, we are seeing a shift towards an approach that encourages individuals and organizations to demonstrate their own sense of responsibility to mitigate risk and be prudent. So it is in this spirit that we will continue to maintain a degree of restrictions in our gatherings, including in our Jamaat Khanas, so as to keep the Jamaat safe. For the foreseeable future, we intend to uphold our current restrictions, especially whilst the case numbers are high and there is a portion of the population that is not fully vaccinated. We would encourage those in the Jamaat who have not taken up the opportunity to get vaccinated or not received their second dose to strongly consider doing so. Finally, I would like to close by offering our humble shukrana to Maulana Hazar Imam for his guidance, blessings, and baraka, and pray for the health and happiness of Maulana Hazar Imam and his family. Once again, Imamat de Mubarak. May we all feel the love of the Imam in our hearts, his hand on our shoulders, and his guidance in our minds as we continue to navigate the journey of life and the inevitable challenges and opportunities that lie ahead. May we all seek comfort in the fact that even in times of darkness, our faith, the love of our Imam, 
and the support of our spiritual sisters and brothers are constant reminders that we are never alone. Thank you. Yali Madat. Bismillahirrahmanirrahim. Yali Madat. In his remarks to a gathering arranged by the then Ismaili Association for Pakistan in January 1958, Moran Hazar Imam said, it is very hard indeed to go through one's history without questioning things. And I'm particularly pleased that you should do this work, that you as my chief spiritual children should go through their own history and try to understand the development which has happened so that you can explain to your children what is the meaning of Imam and what is the meaning of Iman. As we mark the 64th Imam Day of uh, our beloved Maulana Hazar Imam, it would be appropriate for us to reflect on our own history, to see what we can learn from it about the concept of Imam and Imamat. Let me start by narrating first the episode about the siege of the city of uh, Mahdiya, during which our Jamaat went through a very difficult period. All of us have heard of the Fatimid period of our history. We know, for instance, that it starts with Imam al-Mahdi at the beginning of the 10th century. A few years after the establishment of the Fatimids, Imam al-Mahdi had arranged to build a city in what is now Tunisia. That city was called al-Mahdiya, which became the capital city of the uh, Fatimid Empire. Later, towards the end of the Imamate of Imam al-Qaim salam, who was the second Fatimid Caliph, a rebellion led by Abu Yazid Khariji gained strength and almost succeeded in overthrowing the Fatimids. Abu Yazid swiftly conquered most of the territories ruled by the Fatimids in North Africa, even seizing the major city of uh, uh, Kerava. At one point, the Fatimid Caliphate was essentially limited to the boundaries of the relatively small city of uh, Mahdiya, which was about half a kilometer wide and about one and a half kilometer deep. And that's it. Fortunately, the rebels could not be break through the iron gates and the fortified walls of the city. So they decided to blockade Mahdiya. The Jamaat and the Imam were trapped in the city for nearly a whole year. We are told that the forces of uh, Mahdiya put up stiff resistance and their counterattacks ultimately forced Abu Yazid and his troops to retreat. Now, it is interesting to look at the role played by the Imams during these difficult times. We know, for instance, that during this period and after the siege as well, there were rebellions in the Fatimid domains at multiple locations. The Imam had sent his own son to fight the enemies. Now, while these battles were going on, Imam al qaim passed away. His son, now Imam al mansur had to keep this secret so that the Jamaat would not get demoralized during this difficult time and their enemies would not get a psychological advantage. Now, despite the fact that he was now Imam, uh, Al-Mansur took an aggressive stance and pursued the enemy forces for many months, finally defeating them a year later. On the very day of Abu Yazid's final defeat, Imam Al-Mansur declared himself as the Imam and Caliph, and publicly assumed his title of Al-Mansur bin Nasrallah, meaning the victorious with the help of God. So on the part of the Imam, we know that as the spiritual master, as the Mawla of the Jamaat, he showed courage in the face of adversity. He demonstrated a spirit of sacrifice putting his own son's life in danger for the protection of the Jamaat, as well as 
a deep sense of care for the Jamaat's well-being and the Jamaat's unity. Now, this is something that each one of us has experienced in our own lifetimes as well, where our beloved Imam has demonstrated his affection for his Jamaat, not just through words of care and concern, but also through personal and institutional effort to enhance the quality of life of the whole Jamaat. Because indeed, the Imam sees it as part of the responsibility of the Imam of the time. You know, when the city of Mahdiya was built and uh, Imam al-Mahdi inspected its uh, stone fortifications, the iron gates, he said that all of this is a provision only for one moment of a day. Now there's a related story in the sources where the Imam asks someone to shoot an arrow from the wall of the city westwards. Where the arrow landed, the Imam arranged to build a musalla, a place of congregational prayer, and said that the Sahibul Himar, meaning the master of the donkey, will arrive here. Now it is said that the rebel leader Abu Yazid Hariji, who was known to ride a donkey, uh, he came with his forces to the gates of Al Mahdi, which were, of course, close to him. He waited there just for a moment, the sources tell us, before moving on, uh, because he realized that he will never be able to breach the gate. It is also said that his first attack on the city of Madia, it reached the Musalla, that place of gathering that the Imam had built, but was eventually pushed back and he could not advance any further. Thus, as the sources say, fulfilling the prophecy of Imam al-Mahdi. I think this teaches us about another aspect of the role of the Imam in our lives. Imam al-Mahdi had thought ahead about the challenges that may come and had developed the defenses of the city accordingly. It has been this sort of prescient, forward-looking guidance from the Imam of the time that has enabled our Jamaat worldwide to develop resilience, to overcome challenges, and to continue to make progress. Let me give you another example of this. In March 1940, Hazrat Imam Sultan Muhammad Shah salam, delivered a message to the Jamaats in Hunza, Gilgit, and other areas in Badakhshan via the All India Radio. In this message, which he delivered in Farsi, he blessed the Jamaat, but he advised them to educate themselves and to learn European languages and English. Now consider what must have been the living conditions and quality of life of the Jamaat there at that time. Now learning English might have been the last thing on their minds in view of the everyday challenges that they had to overcome. Yet, the Imam advised them to educate themselves and to learn European languages, particularly English. Today, that region has one of the highest levels of literacy and education, as well as gender parity. And that in turn has had a dramatic effect on the quality of life of the Jamaat in that part of the world. So when we mark the Imam day of our Imam, the blessing that we are celebrating is the access that we have to such prescient guidance throughout our history. Uh, let me now move on to another episode from our history, which is also from Fatimid times. It is said that on a cold, blustery winter's day, Hazrat Imam al muiz alayhi salam invited several of the leaders of the Jamaat to his palace. When they arrived, they saw the Imam standing in a large square room, wearing a robe over his clothes. In front of him was a raised desk with an ink pot, and he was surrounded by many documents. Then he said to the leaders, I thought of calling you so that you could see what I do when I'm away from you and far from your eyes. 
My status exceeds yours only because I have responsibility over your affairs on earth and because God has singled me out as your imam. I busy myself with letters that come to me from the east and the west to which I respond in my own hand. My concern with the pleasures of the world lies solely in what protects your lives, makes your lands prosper, defeats your enemies, and subdues your opponents. Now, this is just one of many episodes we find in our history that remind us of the unrelenting efforts of our Imams for the protection, for the guidance, and progress of the Jamaat. Many of us will remember uh, Marana Hazar Imam's concluding irshad of the Golden Jubilee, where he says, and I quote, that I have had nothing else of real significance in my life other than serving the Jamaat, unquote. Like uh, many in the Jamaat, I remember hearing stories from a very young age about how hard our Imam has worked for our betterment. Much like a parent, he has sacrificed his time, his energy, to ensure that his jamaat has the guidance that it needs in accordance with the times, and that their quality of life continues to improve. This is why one of the sentiments that is often expressed on the occasion of uh, Imam Ad day is that of uh, gratitude to God for having a spiritual leader amongst us who has shepherded our lives with such care and such affection. Now, for the final episode, let me return once more to the Fatimids. Uh, you know, when Imam al-Mahdi moved to his newly built capital, the Mahdiya that we talked about, there occurred a dispute between some of his murids regarding lands that the Imam had gifted to them. The Imam asked a trusted murid to investigate the matter and to report back to him. Now this murid did as he was told and he reported back to the Imam and on the basis of this, the Imam resolved the dispute. Then the Imam turned to this man and uh, he said, you have discharged the task uh, entrusted to you. You may now retire and may God bless you. We are told that this gentleman was disappointed that the Imam did not grant him a material reward. And this showed on his face as he left the Imam's uh, presence. Now, Ustad Jodhar, a trusted chamberlain of the Imam, he noticed this and he asked the disappointed man as to why he was feeling this way. The man said that instead of the blessing, he would have preferred to receive something that he could enjoy when he got back home. Ustad Jodhar explained to him that the blessings of the Imam upon him is better for him than anything in this world. But the man was not satisfied. So Ustad Jodhar offered to buy the blessings from him, which the man agreed to sell for 10 dinars. Ustad Jodhar gave him 20 dinars in return for him wishing that God blesses Jodhar with the blessings that were meant for him. Three days later, the Imam hears about this exchange and he summons Ustad Jodhar to ask if it was true that this man had, as the Imam put it, asked to exchange the best thing for the meanest thing. Now on confirmation from uh, Ustad Jodhar, the Imam said, quote, I ask God, creator of the heavens and the earth, that he blesses you for, you for what you have bought and that he bless you until you meet God, the mighty, the exalted, for your devotion to us. The Imam also ordered that Ustad Jodhar be awarded 100 dinars and a precious uh, robe of honor. Now, you know, this episode is a good reminder for us not to take the presence, the grace, and the blessings of the Imam for granted. Remember, of all the Shia communities, we are the only ones to have been fortunate to have had 
a living and physically accessible Imam amongst us throughout our history. The Imam has facilitated our understanding and practice of faith by contextualizing Islamic teachings for us. He is guiding the change in the relationship between the practice of faith, the times in which we live, and our diverse cultural context. For us, the Imam is the bearer of the Noor of Imamat that has been handed down from generation to generation from the first Imam, Maulana Murtaza Ali, to the present Imam. This Noor, this light, symbolizes the God-given wisdom or hikmah and the inner reality of the Imam. The grace and barakah that comes from the presence of this Noor amongst us and from his blessings is something that we must forever cherish. Let me take this opportunity to wish all viewers Imam de Mubarak. May this auspicious occasion bring much happiness and barakah for all. Thank you and Yaliwara.